Welcome YouTubers. Um, in this video I'm going to give a, a rather lengthy um, lecture on DC battery backup systems and some of the components you need and um, why so much mis misinformation is out there. Um, they're quite unique or complex little items these, these uh, you know sealed lead or lead acid batteries or sealed lead acid batteries or whatever you want to use as a battery backup and um, this is stuff I've learned on my own is probably good for a basic class for sure and uh, even your some of your intermediate uh, knowledgeable people might uh, learn a thing or two uh, I'm not a super expert on these things and I'm not going to go into like the chemistry of batteries and all this advanced stuff there are other videos that you could probably watch on stuff like that but mostly my topics today are going to be you know this DC crap it's expensive um, for good quality items um, you know you just don't take a couple old car batteries and and plan on running a refrigerator for a couple weeks it just doesn't doesn't work that way or a cheap solar panel and get things going um, there's a lot of opinions and advice under these products. You see them in Q&As on Amazon or Walmart or whatever else, and even the websites, um, you know, people who are battery professors or something online. Um, there's a lot of inaccuracy, and it's either bad, bad opinions and advice, or inaccurate, definitely very inaccurate, and uh, a lot of it's data less. It's like, hey, yeah, I, uh, you know, ran my trolling motor all day on a um, cheap little battery. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so, but but whatever you say, um, and you even see it. I'll get into some details on that. And um, starting type batteries, so car batteries aren't aren't good uh, items. Uh, you need deep cell batteries. That's a topic I'll talk about. Charging a battery takes more time than anticipated. I'll go into detail on how um, what happens when a battery is being charged, so you can uh, make some wise decisions there. Uh, batteries themselves vary widely in self-reporting their capacity because there is no regulation. Um, and so, yeah, batteries all over. Sometimes they don't give you any info, and, and sometimes they're very misleading. Other people do a really good job, other manufacturers or other um, people selling batteries. But for the most part, yeah, you go into the battery and the guy, oh, yeah, this is, this is the capacity of the battery, and it's just it's not true. And uh, Most draw calculations that you see that people give you a... This is how you, you calculate your how long your battery is going to last, right? It's just they way overestimate battery life, or they'll just overestimate in general. There's something called Pukert's Law out there, so I'll get into Pukert's Law. Uh, AC inverter loss uh, is real and significant. A lot of people don't factor that in there and end up with dead batteries or way undersize their system or oversize their system, which, again, DC crap is expensive. So both are both are this is just trying to get your accuracy out there. And I'll give you some handy accessories and calculations along the way. So that's what I intend on doing uh, in the series. If you if any of that sounds exciting, then go ahead and listen. Otherwise, tune out and keep uh, keep taking advice from from people that um, a lot of times they can with this info you can tell that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. All right. See ya. So I drew in a diagram of a lot of components of a DC battery system and you don't need to use all these components um, but in general what you're trying to do is I've got what I call appliances over here I put a chest freezer but it could easily be other stuff that you want to run like um, I've got drills I've got fans I've got lights I've got uh, refrigeration freezers uh, computers TVs you know there's all kinds of reasons why you all kinds of stuff you want to run in your life and typically you know, you're going to plug them into your house or AC power. You know, that comes from a power plant. But, you know, this, this is pretty well up and running most of the time. It's the power in your house, and you plug your TV into your house, and you don't need all this stuff, right? You can you can run it right off your house. Um, other times, if you're kind of off-grid, you want to do some off-grid, or you're in a you know a car, an RV, or you're just at a campsite or a you know, tailgating party or whatever, you might have, you might need to get some, some power to these items and you don't have your house anymore, you don't have a nice grid and you can't run an extension cord to somebody with, that's running off the big power grid or the electric company, then you need some kind of generator and a lot of times there's some gas generators, anything with an engine and a, an alternator that's going to produce AC current. Um, you can have an engine and an alternator that produces DC current, like your car, 
Um, but you don't want to, you know, you don't always want to run your car, and especially like tailgating or something like that. And so there's other ways to generate power too, like from the sun with solar panels, or from the wind, from with um, wind generators. And I spoke about the car. Uh, another way that you're just going to get straight DC power um, to run some of your items. Um, and you can run these items straight from these without any battery but occasionally you know what happens is that the sun goes away or the wind goes away or you need to you know you're burning gas or you run out of gas or you need to stop while you're doing gas and occasionally even your house even though it's up most of the time occasionally your house will lose power uh, like in storms or just rolling at blackouts or whatever you got depending on how the power company's win is and so then it's useful to have a battery backup because then you can continue to run these things even though you lose your source of power over here. But you'll be running off your battery. And so this is what I'm talking about in general. So the most common method is to take your house, get a car charger, or you know just a DC battery charger um, to charge your batteries. And so when you're so let me talk about the charging side first, and, and normally people get the house power, get your car battery charger, and that does an AC to DC conversion, and there's a lot of loss, that's why I draw this little heat thing in here, you know, there's a lot of loss um, in efficiency, and it starts to charge your battery. Um, first of all, you need a deep cycle battery bank. Um, Car batteries are made with thin plates with a lot of surface area. They're, my, they're made for providing quick cranking amps to your car engine. And then, you know, they get replenished rather quickly. So you, they don't, you don't want to draw down car batteries. You don't want to run a, a refrigerator off your car battery without the, the engine running. Once the engine's running in your car, you've got an alternator. And that's going to produce um, good power. But... If you just want to leave this running in your car, you're going to, um, car batteries with the thin plates, that's going to heat up, it's going to potentially warp the plates, um, and then your your battery goes to crap, and you're just not built to do that. Whereas deep cycle, or even marine grade, have thicker plates, so they're more resistant. Just think of thin metal being heated up, that, that tends to warp and break, and when they warp and break, that's when they're, they're no good. Um, there's other reasons that a battery can go no good, too, but... Uh, basically, car batteries aren't made to do the, the deep cycle that we're talking about to run appliances for a long time by themselves independently. You can do it, you can use them in a pinch uh, in a super emergency, and you happen to have a car battery versus nothing. Hey, it's better than nothing. Um, but realize that, you know, for long term sustainability or off grid or just camping or whatever, you just, or your RV or whatever, you want these, right? Deep cycles. Um, so a battery. If, if you take all the inputs and the outputs off of it, so you're not pulling any out of it, you're put, not putting any into it, and you let it settle for a while, and it comes down to whatever voltage it rests at, and you take the surface charge off, then it, a typical full 12-volt battery is going to run 12.6, 12.7 volts. That's going to indicate it's fully charged, get all its capacity um, that's inside the battery. And so if it's less than that, then you've got a partially charged battery. And... In order to, the, what, these, what these power things do is the batteries, um, by the chemistry, will start charging themselves probably as low as 12.9. But I put 13.1 out here. So once you start hitting 12.9, 13, 13.1 volts, the chemistry starts reversing itself and the ions are doing what they're doing. And they'll start char recharging, you know, chemistry-wise. So... Um, once you start applying that type of voltage, so it's a, there's a gap between that 12.6, 12.7 to 13, or even 12.9, and the, the more, the higher the, the voltage out here, I put up to 14.8, um, the quicker this will, you know, start receiving charges and the quicker it will do its stuff. Once you start going above there, like above 15 and stuff, um, it starts getting a little too much energy and the liquid starts like bubbling. Um, not necessarily boiling, but they, you know, you can call it boiling. It looks like boiling because there are bubbles popping up on it. Heat is being generated as you're putting this voltage in here. So the more and more you put, if you put start putting 18 volts or something, it starts generating so much heat in here that it will start warping your plates or causing other boil off of the electrolytes and, and that type of damage. So you don't want to you know, charge stuff at 
20 volts. It's just um, not a good idea. I mean, I know, I know a couple chargers might do that for a short term just to balance your stuff and stuff like that, but simulating, you know, vibration when your car, you know, when you're um, in a boat or something, you got vibration, which helps knock, you know, some of the sulfates and stuff off the, off the, um, the ribs and, and metal plates in there. But in general, um, this is what most people, most chargers will charge at in this area. And, and they'll do it in a couple stages, and I'm going to explain charging the battery in a little bit. But basically, this is, you, you buy that voltage, it charges up, and then you take all the voltages off, and you can come to a rest. Um, so you'll need these, these AC to DC converters, and they go, you know, they're, they start, like, just basic car battery chargers, or you can get a, you know, $5 Harbor Freight float type that will eventually charge these. I've got an expensive RV grade um, controller um, that provides 55 amps in my example. So it'll, um, super, you actually want to use that in a battery bank, not an individual battery, but the, there'll be an, um, amperages that these will deliver. Um, the higher the amperage, the quicker it'll charge the battery and the more heat that will be generated in the battery and stuff like that. So you got to Gotta watch yourself. Now the opposite is taking like solar or wind or anything that produces DC. They usually pr produce at a high voltage or a relatively high voltage over the, what we're talking here. Uh, but you got a controller, so um, you'll need a controller in line. I've got a. This is the most uh, on Amazon. This is a twenty dollar uh, seven amp, good for about a hundred watt Sun Force. So I'll put a link below with some of these uh, components. Some of them, um, just so you can. Um, get an idea of what I'm what I'm showing what I'm using but the way this one works is basically it allows if it's below the 13.1 it allows the power to go in from your solar setup and this charges the battery and then when the battery gets up to 14.8 it kind of shunts it off turns it off and disconnects it and this uh, this this battery starts to start to head back from 14.8 down to 12.6, 12.7 kind of drifts down. There's kind of that's the way it works. Doesn't immediately drop. It kind of goes down. When it hits 13.1, this turns it back on. So this guy will go and then pop back up. You know, by the it pops up pretty quickly because you got a fully charged battery. Hopefully at that point in time, and then you know it'll shut it off. So it's doing a cyclical thing. That's the way this cheaper controller work. I know there's probably more expensive controllers and any of these components you can spend, you know, a little or you can spend a ton and they get pretty expensive. Um, a cheap gas two-stroke generator at Harbor Freight is about 90 to 100 bucks um, and then they go anywhere up from there. You can use four-stroke gas, you can use diesel, you can use propane, you can get one sitting out the side of your house for 16 grand, you know, that you see them sold at Home Depot um, as a backup off-grid. Um, so and there's all styles of portable in between. So uh, a lot of a lot of options in generator. I've used a cheap Harbor Freight and it's worked well for me. But realize you're using two-stroke gas when you when you do that. Of course, you get a big generator. You need a lot of gas hanging around. People, oh, I got this huge. You know, I see it all the time. I got this huge generator. I'm like, well, so how many gallons does it take a day? And it takes 10 or 20, you know, a day that you would run during, um, you know, nighttime hours or even during the day. And they got, you know, two gallons of gas hanging around. Well, that's it's going to last you half an hour. So that's some of the, the, the ignorance that you see around when you when you plan on that for a, a extended period of, of not having gas. Um, solar is the same way. Um, these, you know, a, a good deal would, for 100 watt right now would be like um, $150 or $1.50 a watt. But you could easily go up to 2 or $3 a, a watt depending on where you try to source those and try to find those. Um, and the size of your panel and that type of stuff. So um, they can be a little pricey, especially when you figure out how many watts you're going to need, which is a lot. Again, the controllers, I started at $20. Uh, for a more serious one, like a 30 amp, or they go up to 100 bucks, and they go way up above that too. So um, sometimes that's a good investment, sometimes it's not. Um, these guys here, again, chargers start at like 20 bucks or 25 bucks at your auto zone. This one here is about 120. It's a nice 55 amper, but it can certainly go up from there too. Uh, batteries, I won't talk about batteries right now because um, they're all over the, the map on prices and compositions. I'm talking about cheap lead acid ones here. Um, there are, you know, Zorb Glass Mat, there are Lithium, there's all kinds of battery backup options and so uh, all over the board there. But uh, 
normal deep cycle marine from Walmart is a hundred bucks. Um, we'll talk about that in a while. Um, so now we're going to get into the the side of taking stuff out, taking stuff out. So this was putting stuff into the battery, charging it up. You need to charge batteries, and then and replenish batteries, or they'll run dead, right? Um, taking stuff out of the battery, most common is to use an AC inverter. So this converts the DC back to AC. Um, again, anytime you're doing the conversion between AC and DC, you get a lot of inefficiency, heat loss. Um, so it's inefficient. Um, but you can run normal household appliances, stuff you plug into your wall at home. Um, inverters... Uh, the cheap ones are modified sine waves, so they're not a true sine wave, so they kind of clip it like a square wave. And you'll get some hum out of engines, and they won't really, they don't really recommend them for sophisticated electronics like computers and TVs. Uh, but they're good for most instances, and if you had no power, so be it. But true sine wave costs you more. That's mod That's got the full wave, and it's sort of like your house, and it doesn't cause your motors to hum, or, or it will run sophisticated, you know, um, sensitive electronics um, and these come in all different sizes you know you see the ones you plug in your car that are 100 watts or 300 watts they start at 30 bucks um, then they go up from there um, you know Harbor Freight will have these um, modified sine wave a couple thousand watts for 100 bucks or 150 bucks this one's a true sine wave that I got off Amazon it's a Sun Force it's a thousand watt so it's it's not terribly large um, thousand watt continuous and it's a true sine wave that's been okay unit for me there's mixed reviews on that but certainly inverters go up in price from there um, they get heavier and and the more power you need so um, that's the most common way to get power out of a battery and comp plug to a common appliances household plug appliances they do sell DC items. I've got a cheap fan here that I've shown with a cigarette lighter. That's your most indicated thing, and it's got a fuse in it. And so you see that for car accessories. But they make, you know, sort of cabin or household or DC straight appliances. Um, but they get pretty expensive, mostly because you've got a small market here, and you've got a huge market, right? You know, it's appliances, so it's economies of scale. So these items that are DC only... A DC only fridge, a DC only freezer, they get to be very, very um, expensive. And think of like sailboats and stuff like that. That's the most common places that you see. Yeah, again, they're usually smaller. They're not, you know, a, a 28 cubic foot uh, refrigerator. They'll be a small refrigerator that's a, a few cubic feet and not your dorm room fridge, right? You know, the, the, these are made to, to run off DC and be very, very efficient because you're not having that inverter loss. So they're very, very efficient on your battery, but they're very, very expensive. So. But uh, you can research some of those, and uh, they're really good for your system. But like I said, dollars, dollars, dollars. Uh, I got one more loop up here. This is not a very common loop that people follow at all. Um, but this is a buckboard, and this will convert your voltage to another voltage. I put an automotive headlight lamp in there because a lot of these don't have um, current limiting. So this is kind of a, a, a combo secret. So I've got the example of a, a cordless drill over here, or a drill. And, uh, you know, a lot of drills now don't run on 12. They run on, like, 20 volts or 18 volts or whatever. So you can take this and you can boost the 12 up to 18 or 20 or whatever, 22, and it will run this item. Um, or you can charge the battery um, in the item. I know these have a, usually have a plug that will run this route down here. You plug them in and recharge them. But in a pinch, you know, a little more efficient to run it through these. But these buckboards are really cheap. They're like four bucks and a lamp is, you can find a lamp on sale for three bucks or something as a, a current limiter. Um, so that's an option just to have in your, your wheelhouse for, you know, ten bucks and a little bit of wiring in there. You can you can kind of have an option of putting any voltage you want. And some of these go up and some of these go down. So charging your car, charger and stuff like that. Um, you can also use this on the other side to take one battery. I've got a video on that where you take one battery and you can charge it. Just, you know, putting this up at 14.8 or whatever, 14.4 or something. You can charge one battery to another battery, DC to DC. Uh, that'll help in a pinch if you ever want to consolidate batteries um, in an emergency. Because, you, you know, you don't want to um, take one battery run. You can take a battery run through an inverter and charge another battery, but you just, it's, it's much more efficient to do that. So, uh, that's something just to take a look at an example 
Uh, then I'll, I'll talk about some accessories down here. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about a few of them right now because they're I'll, I'll be using them in the upcoming slides. One of them is a kilowatt. Um, it's a pretty common item for measuring uh, AC uh, watts and, and, and total runtime watts. And I've got a DC amp meter, a clamp style is the type I preferred because it's just simple. Um, so you, DC amps and uh, AC watts or AC amps, it's, it, those are the two uh, big ones that I'm going to use in calculations here. You're going to need, to, uh, you highly recommend that you get some of those when you get into this arena. So let's talk about battery capacity. That's a pretty important topic. Um, first, let me start with the state of state of charges map that I've got laid out here. I talked about 12.6, 12.7 being a fully charged, 100% charged battery, um, and then it drops from there. So if you put a voltmeter on your battery, again at at uh, not not uh, at a, a resting state. Uh, 12.5 would be 90, so a tenth, basically a tenth going down there. Another tenth will get you. 80, another tenth will get you 70, another tenth, when I say tenth, you know, you have the one decimal point here, 12.2 will get you 60, 12.1 over 50, and then it starts to drop more than a tenth there, and eventually you get to down to 10.5, which is a flat zero. Mostly you're going to want to know the ones in the 50 to 100 percent range, I'll talk about that in a little bit, you don't want to run your, even your deep cells, you don't want to deep discharge into this area down here. If you can avoid it, you should. Um, basically it reduces your, your battery life. Um, number of cycles you'll be able to run in your life. So you're, you're chewing through your batteries. Um, of course if you, you know, in a real emergency and you want to run them down because you, you know, you don't have an alternative, then so be it. But what I'm, I'm the point I'm getting here is you know a little bit about this. You take the 12.6 and go a tenth, but but your, your, a lot of your DC meter accuracy might only be at the tenths. You know, it might read a 12.5 and not a whole bunch of decimal places after that because we're, we're talking about a, a very small amount of difference can make a big difference in your state of charge. And when you try to try to take a couple meters, even from the factory, and you, you, take, you, you check it with one meter, you check it with another meter, and one reads 12.5 and one reads, uh, I don't know, 12.3. That could be a couple tenths off. Um, you know, there's a big difference between 90% charged and 70% charged, or even the opposite. You think it tells you you're 70 and you're actually 90 or 60, 80. Um, so you, you don't want to run into that scenario. Um, and, and so I'm going to advocate a little bit of reference standarding on your, on your, on your um, DC voltmeters um, to get you in the ballpark of 12, to get you more accuracy. Because, it's again, you make a mistake out here, um, you're going to be way off on the charge percentage, and, and you're going to really do some squirrely stuff like buy extra batteries or what you're going to do if you if you run some real world examples. So that's my, my lecture and I'll, I'll come back to that a few times but that's what the chart looks like for uh, voltage and state of charge. So battery capacity um, usually stated in something like amp hours. Let me first give you the formula amps times volts equals watts. Um, typically watts is your appliance and it's pretty standard so if I'm running a, a hair dryer let's just say it's 1200 watts uh, make it math a little easier here so the hair dryer is always going to pull 1200 watts um, and that composes, composes of volts times amps if you plug it into your American wall outlet we'll call it 120 volt um, so 1200 divided by 120 would tell you you're pulling 10 amps AC out of the wall um, but it also works when you do this AC to DC conversion so that the hair dryer is still going to pull 1200 watts when you're running it off a battery bank but the volts are now 12 volt battery bank just say example so now you're pulling 1200 divided by 12 or 100 amps 100 amps DC out of a battery so the same hair dryer pulls 10 amps out of an AC wall or 100 amps out of a DC. So you can get those amps. Um, so amps, translating back to the amps with the unit, the volts also, also are determined by your system or where you're pulling the energy from. So that's how you can use that to go back and forth to figure out. You're going to need to get familiar with that. Um, it helps to convert things to watts. And if you got the, the kilowatt, you got the watts that your appliance is using. If it's an AC item. Now if it's straight DC, then you know, your volts stay constant and you're just uh, pulling amps out of a battery and you do it you can do the amps measurement eventually you'll have to get it back to amps is what I'm saying because most batteries are rated in amp hours 
And just for an example, if I had a 100 amp hour battery, this is just a notional calculation, don't take this to heart. And you had a 12, it was a 12 volt battery with a 100 amp hour rated, then just do the math there, amps. And you get 1200, 1200 watts is sort of what's in a battery. People ask that a lot, what's in a battery? I'm just going to say 1200 watts. Um, it's kind of an ignorant statement, but you see it all over that way. Um, so I'm going to get in more detail about exactly how long your battery or how much capacity your battery has. But just as a rule of thumb, just think about that real quick. Um, so you better be able to run your hair dryer. Now a typical deep cycle, I say could be, rated to run... So most deep cycles, when you look at them, there'll be a rating on your sticker, on your battery, that tell you how you how they determined, hopefully how they determined how many amp hours it is and, and what method they used to um, give you that rating. And so the 20-hour uh, run to flat has been a common um, testing method to compare batteries or just for informational purposes. So what they'll do is the manufacturer will determine how, you know, what the determine a rate that kills their battery in 20 hours. And that's sort of been a testing standard. I know it sounds a little complex, but battery manufacturers are able to do this. So in order, so if you take a fully charged battery and, and you run it at whatever rate it's going to be, and it dies in 20 hours, it's completely dead, flat, in 120 hours, then uh, in this case, I'm going to, that measurement for them came out to be 5 amps. So 5 amps would kill it in 20 hours. That's how they do it. And then you multiply the amps by amp hours to get amp hours. And they call that a 100 amp hour battery for a 20 amp hour rate. Um, or, you know, at 5 amps is another way to explain it. So you see these all over because it's just not regulated how these uh, battery, I'm going to get into that explanation a little bit on how you get some kind of unscrupulous reporting. But it, that's a pretty typical deep cycle for years and years. It's a 100 amp hour battery, and they determined it with a 20 hour run rate. Um, so basically, effectively, 5 amps. You could pull out 5 amps for 20 hours, and that thing would be dead, dead, dead. You never want to go dead, dead, dead. I'm going to say this again the 50% rule. Uh, once you get down to 50%, so really you're going to get 10 hours out of that, and then you should be recharging it or starting to replenish it um, as opposed to killing it. Um, that's my next statement, so good, good lead in. A uh, deep cycle should be recharged before reaching 50% capacity. Um, you know, if you draw it down to 20% or draw 80% out or, or draw it down to 20% remaining, then you're going to shorten the lifetime. So all batteries sort of have a life cycle. A lot of times these won't be printed on the batteries and not real help for you either. Um, they're... Uh, so a life cycle on a battery might be, I don't know, 300 cycles or 100 cycles. and and if you if you deep deep draw them out a lot or, or flatline them a lot, then they're going to have less cycles in their life. They might only last like 75 cycles or 50, or it might be 20 cycles. Or really, the the charging that you do could could kill it really really quickly. And like I said, this stuff is expensive, so something you don't want to do. Um, the difference between a, a car battery is you're not going to see like total amp hours or these run rates or any of that type of stuff you typically see cranking amps because again they're not intended to be drawing power out of them uh, without the car running and so they're just made to crank over an engine get replenished pretty quickly uh, when not in use um, with lead acid batteries you should also always keep a charger on it even if it's just a float charger keep them fully charged um, below 12.6 they start to accumulate sulfate on their plates which blocks the ions um, and that, you know, without knocking that sulfate off or, or doing it, something like that, which is difficult, um, the ions, you start to reduce the battery, even though, you know, the battery is the same size and it's got a bunch of plates in there, there's not going to be the ions out on that surface of those plates. So uh, you start to reduce the battery and all of a sudden the battery starts behaving like a small D cell or something if it's really sulfated. So you just don't have that capacity that you thought you had, especially when it was new. And so if you if you let this voltage drop, and if you if you don't keep uh, a charger on a, on a on a battery, you take the battery, you fully charge it, you stick it in the corner of your house, it does lose um, lose probably evaporates a little bit of water, but it also loses um, charge month to month, and those can vary by battery and by temperature. I'm not going to talk about temperature in this, but temperature does affect. You know, if it's hotter, it is the quicker it'll discharge, but you can lose three to ten percent. Per month, 
And so you can go back a few months later and it'll be like, you know, half discharged or something like that. Um, and it's sulfating while it's doing that too. So it's just not a good idea. You can go back nine months and it's fully dead. And a lot of times those batteries don't come back, they're junk. Um, you will eventually junk some batteries um, just through neglect, unless you're really careful. But, you know, you always need to keep these powered in and a little bit of power going to them to keep them uh, floated up and, and good. Otherwise, you're not making full use of your batteries. Um, you do need to water and balance distilled water, and, and balance is more for a battery bank, but even the cells within a battery, um, there's ways to do that. You should look up maintenance, but uh, you don't want to, if you just let it stick it in the corner for nine months and you never check the water, um, or if you're running too many too many amps when you're charging it, you know, it's going to boil that water, evaporate it right out there. It's also your, your evaporating, um, I should have mentioned that you're evaporating, you know, a, a flammable chemical out there. That's why they tell you to recharge them outdoors. But as long as you don't boil the darn stuff, uh, typically you'll be okay. But if you're boiling it, you're putting off all this methane gas inside. A, if you're in a closed area like a garage, that could be dangerous. It could explode. Or the batteries sometimes explode. So don't want to put a lot of amperage on a battery. But keep your water in there too, is what I'm saying. That's do some maintenance. And car batteries are not deep cycle and should not be used. So that's my, my, my lecture on uh, battery capacity. So uh, for charging a lead acid battery, I put out a diagram on, this is my uh, RV grade battery example, or charger example, but most chargers run something like this. So I've got a couple different lines down here on the bottom of the scale, and I've got a dotted line at 12.7. Again, I'm going to call that a fully charged resting state battery voltage. And in this example, I'm starting with a battery that's been discharged down to 12.2, so it's been used, and I'm going to, now it's time to recharge it, right? Hit, hit the 60% mark here. And so, um, as I apply um, the charger, it starts to come up, and if I were to disconnect the charger here and let it set, you know, it'd be at 12.3 or whatever, and 12.4 and 12.5. So, um, that's how this, this graph is working here. So um, there's something called a bulk stage in most of these things where the, the charger is providing its full amps. And so it's going to come up at a rate here. And then there's going to be an absorption stage. So bulk, absorption, and float are your three stages when you're charging. Um, you'll hear those terms. And then it's going to sort of the absorption is a little slower. So this is giving you full amp rateage going into the battery but the battery starts to resist and then it, it sort of takes a long long period at this this semi amperage statement and then eventually it gets to be fully charged and then you're just applying amperage that just keeps this thing from discharging keeps it at the 12.7 so that's what it looks like if the, at the battery at rest um, but the, the two other lines I got out here are completely independent but this is what's happening when you this this blue line is the voltage at the battery terminals and this red line is the amperage that the charger is providing so let's talk about those real quick because that's the important part here so when I turn on the charger um, some of your you know automotive type charging batteries they have a selector on them and some battery chargers just have a selection you can charge a 2 amp mode a 8 amp mode a 10 amp mode or 12 amp mode or 20 amp mode whatever amp mode you put you put you can set your battery charger to that um, in my RV case I just goes to 55 there's no setting so that's a lot of amps of course but um, that's why it's expensive but when you turn on the, the charger it's going to provide a voltage and an amperage up to what you set it, the maximum that you set it. So let's just call it 10 amps here or whatever, right? Put on the 10 amp setting, it's going to deliver 10 amps to the battery, and this voltage is going to come up at the battery terminal. It's going to come up pretty quickly. And then as the battery starts to charge up, it provides internal resistance, and so the same amperage starts to raise the voltage at a slower rate and a slower rate and a slower rate. So it tends to, to weed off that way. Until it gets to this point, and I'm, I've driven in here at 14.7, that's what my battery, and that's what I recommend, um, something in that range, and most battery chargers do it around this range, 14.7, and that was what I determined to be the bulk stage, and they call it a bulk because you're given the full amperage, 
out of the charger and it's raising the voltage up. But once it gets here, if you continue to provide full amperage, then this is going to continue to rise. And you're going to get up over 15, 16, 17. You're going to be producing all that gas. You're going to be uh, getting a lot of heat in the battery. You're going to warp plates or the battery can explode, pop the case. <coughs> all kinds of bad stuff can happen. So usually these controllers have some smart electronics in them. A microprocessor that once it hits this um, voltage, their set voltage up here, it starts to drop the amps according to the battery resistance. It starts to drop the amps to maintain this voltage. So this is, starts to be the absorption phase. And it continues to drop because the battery gets more and more charged. It continues to drop the amps. My RV has a, a step down where it will gently, more gently produce this. But a lot of them just come to here and eventually drop at the float. But anyways, you're going to drop, the point is you drop current, you drop current, you drop amperage here until you reach um, a point where if you were to tur turn it off, it kind of senses that, again with the electronics, that you're getting down to this 13.1 um, level, in which case if you were to take it off, the battery would, would if you turn off the charger, the battery would drift back down, that's that one hour type thing or whatever I talk about before doing your measurement, it'll drift back down to 12. So it's fully charged here. So all it's doing at this point is just providing a minimum amount of amperage to drive this battery with the current resistance up from 12.7 to 13.1. 13 13.1 is a pretty common float voltage. So um, yeah, if you turn it off, it'll drift down. You turn it back on and it will come back up to the float voltage. So that's what a floater just provides minimum amperage. There is some amperage involved. Um, but just enough to keep it so it's charging. So it's the 13.1, right? It's just in case this, because if you don't, if you put it below that, this will start to drop and you'll lose. You know, again, it's doing bad stuff, sulfating and stuff like that. So you just, that's where the float voltage is. That's the way the chargers work. Unfortunately, you know, this, this might take, uh, you know, on a not terribly discharged, this might take a couple hours here to do the bulk charging and you get up to 80, 85% of your charge, then the remaining 15-20% takes 10 darn hours, right? This thing just takes a while. The battery is the battery. It doesn't go any quicker than that. And it doesn't accept electrons any quicker. And your amperage is dropping anyway. So even though you, you think, hey, you know, I've got a 100 amp hour battery. I discharge at 60%. I need to put 40 amp hours in. I'm putting it on the 10 amp rate. I should be done in four hours. Nope, not going to work that way. Again, you'll get most of it in, in that two hours, right? You'll get the, the 20, you get the back to 80 from 60 to 80 in that two hours, but after that it's going to take like 10 hours. That's why it takes 12, 16 hours overnight basically to charge a battery. Of course, in order to do this charging, when you're when you're in your house, it's no problem. You plug it in, the power company's working, you're good. But if you got a, you're gonna, trying to run a generator, now you got to run that generator 16 hours just to charge that little bit of battery, or you got to have the solar panels. You got to, you know, solar panels aren't good 24 hours a day, right? So they they take the next day to do this absorption, um, or you need to buy a lot of solar panel. It just doesn't work any quicker just because you have a bunch of amperage out here in your charger and your solar panel. That final uh, takes a lot of time. So that's something people don't realize is that, you know, man, it's like 12, 16 hours to recharge your battery, but a lot of it, very few of it's in bulk. So some of the strategy when you're in survival is to uh, just fill it up with the bulk. And once this amperage starts dropping, yeah, you got an 80% battery, but at least you're not wasting gas in your generator or having to turn a car on all the time and you definitely won't be floating in that case but this is maintenance of a battery overall so that's a good intro so I talked about charging a battery and then there was a battery now I'm going to charge talk about taking stuff out of a battery and what uh, people don't realize or people don't know it's Pukert's law um, and what Pukert's law says is the greater the discharge rate, the lower the delivered capacity of the battery. So the capacity will change depending on what your rate is. And I know that's, you know, just because you double the amperage you're pulling out of a battery, oh yeah, no doer, it's, going to, it's only going to last half as long. Well, it actually doesn't last half as long, it lasts less than half as long. And that's something that people don't get. So I'm going to go into a little detail. So basically a battery rated for 100 amp hours, and it was derived from a factory test rating of 20 hours at 5 amps, that same battery we were talking about before. Just because you go to 10 amps, you figure you would get 10 hours, and you see this calculation a ton. 
out on webs and people's opinions, and it's just really misinformed and it's misleading and it's and it's a novice in, in, in its nature. It's yeah, it's great to do that calculation. Yeah, it's 100 amp hours, so if I take 10 amps, I should be able to get 10 10 hours out of it, and it's it's just not true. Perkett's law says that you will only get 7.6 hours at pulling 10 amps out of there. So the more amps you pull, the less hours you get out of the same rated battery. And so I pulled these from a um, very common Google search battery capacity, and it's one of the top links. And they go through the step-by-step -step into the Pukert's equation. So I'll just give you the equation, because what the heck, time and hours, is these are always the same number and this is going to be your discharge rate. So this is the 20 hour I was talking about in my example. It ended up being a 100 amp hour battery at the 20 hour rate. So those are all constants you put in for your battery and here's where I'm pulling 10 amps out. This is my variable down here. Um, so I put that number in depending on my amperage load that I'm pulling out and the 1.4 exponential is for um, lead acid batteries that are other exponents for, for other types of batteries. Um, but your lead acid is 1.4. So I know this, this is a lot of math, but unfortunately the math is, some, math is something that's required and not your basic math, right? Rule of thumb math, because you'll run out of battery. And basically they go through the steps of that, but they say this, this is, they're saying how long this 100 amp hour battery will last if 10 amps is continuously drawn, then it will last 7.6 hours, it'll last 10 hours. That's, that's what I'm trying to get to. That's why, you know, batteries run short on people. And you can play these variables around. Once you know it, so I drew a chart that's a little more full expanding. I used, you know, I put I put in the values that are various. Same example here, DC draw, same battery. This is the they they rated it from the factory at 20 20 hours, last 20 hours at 5 amps. So it's a 100 amp hour battery for their rating. So at 5 amps, I get the the purple pink line here is um, that stupid calculation, um, just straight math. And the black line or the blue line here is the the Pukert real curve. So again, it's going to match here because that's what the battery is rated at. Um, here's the example where I said, hey, let's put 10 amps in. So I got 5 amps, 10 amps, 20 amps, 20, 50 amps, 100 amps, and then out here I got 2 and 1 amps. So at 10 amps, I did the calculation with 100 amp hour, and people online are going to tell you, oh, it's going to last 10 hours. That's a good rule of thumb. No, last 7.6. You get the 20 amps again. 20 times 5, so you get 5 hours, you expect to get 5 hours for it to be fully drained, and instead you only get 2.8. And 50 amps, instead of 2, you get 0.8, and it, you know, again, if you draw 100 amps at a 100 amp battery, most people say you get an hour. No, you get 0.3 uh, hours, or 18 minutes, and that's fully drained. Use the 50% rule, you really get 9 minutes, right, to hit 50%. And so, who, you know, who would be drawing 100 amps out of their battery? Well, just think of, not a hair dryer, that's good example, but maybe you do run your dryer at a campsite or something, but you know, think about one of those electric coil stoves that you get that you plug in, and those those will draw. You're trying to boil some water, right? So with nine minutes, yeah, you could probably get that water up to boiling, but you can't boil it for ten minutes to make it sort of safe um, in an extreme situation here, so you would need a couple batteries or three batteries to kind of do it. You just see that the amperage, you're gonna, it's just not going to last that hour that you thought you were going to get, and you'd be able to charge just because you bought Something, something like that. Now the inverse of that is that at two amps, my ca the the stupid calculation comes out to 50 hours. But in reality, you're going to get more. So again, you're misestimating on this side too. So you're misestimating over here in a bad way. Here it's misestimating a good way, but but still it's a misestimation. You're buying more battery than you probably need. And it's the same thing when you get out to one amps. Um, again, 100 amp hour on on one amp it should be last 100 hours, but really it lasts 190 hours. So big differences, um, and this is where some of your manufacturers, they can, there's no regulation, uh, on, and so I'll give you an, an example on the next slide, but again, they can say that their battery is rated at 190 amp hours at one amp, so it's a 190 amp hour battery. In this case, it's like a 72 amp hour battery, well, it was times two amps, so it's 144. So they can say it's a 190 amp hour battery, they can say it's a 144 amp hour battery, they can say it's a 100 amp hour battery, Heck, out here they could say it's a uh, let's see a thirty a thirty amp hour battery. They're never going to say that. How are they going to sell batteries if they tell you it's a thirty amp hour battery? But they they can tell you it's a hundred. They can tell you it's a hundred forty four. They can tell you it's a hundred ninety, and they'll do that. So that's uh, something to watch for. 
Um, and when you, if you ever do reverse capacity, that reserve capacity is another, I mean, you just, they're not even required to, to put it out there. I'll come back to this again and again and again. But it's important to find, if they do give you a rating, find out what your 20 amp hour rate is, and then you can compare batteries one to another and the prices of it. So um, that's why, in most cases, you start putting heavy loads out there, and that battery doesn't last nearly as long as you thought doing a simple calculation. You've got to go get this, uh, this uh, Pooker's Law out here. So just to further go into the Pooker's Law, I'm going to pick on a Walmart Group 29. Um, I own four of these myself. And, and I didn't know a lot when I started, but you go to Walmart. This is available usually at your local Walmart, Marine Grade, Deep Cycle. Uh, it's one of the bigger ones they have on the shelf. So you walk into any Walmart, it's about $86 when it's running low price or on sale. And they don't really give you a rating online, and there's a lot of misinformation. If you ever go out to that website, matter of fact, they have an EverStart expert, right? They answered most of the darn questions on their Q&A. And it's like, oh, how many amp hours is it? And it's because it doesn't state in its stats. And they tell you it's 122 amp hours. And sometimes it's 114. And gee, I don't know if there's a lot of variability in these, but I've got four of them over the years, and they're all 122 um, at one amp. And so, yeah, you get these EverStart experts. So I posted a couple comments. It takes five to seven business days. I'll see if uh, Walmart disallows those. But that, that's where you get sort of a lot of misinformation. So I know it's 122 amp hours at one amp. That's what it's been stamped and tested on my battery. And most of these, I've had four of them, like I said. So I, I, I use Pukert's. And um, I've got an Excel formula out here. Again, this is just Pukert's formula. So if you ever have to plug this. Now, this battery is just running the 1 amp, so these these are both 122, and that's 122. And the B2 is the cell that I'm going to plug the amps into, and that's the exponential 1.4. So this is what's out in column A for your for your uh, time and hours, right, the formula. And so I did, when I plug 1 amp in and I put my formula in here, it tells me 122 hours. So 122 hours, 1 amp, 122 amp hours. So that's matching up with what they're rating over here because that's what they told me. They, again, they don't have to even tell me that when you're pulling batteries, but if you don't know that, then you just don't know what you're getting. So I plugged in relative amps that may be a common load just for it to help me out. So 2, 5, 8, I'm going to come back to 8, but uh, 10, 20, 25, 50, 20, 50, and 100. And basically I fudged some of these numbers to get me to a 25-hour draw. So 25 hours to dead and 20 hours to dead. Again, this is the most common rating of batteries that most non-scrupul non or whatever you want to call it uh, good people put. So at 20 hours it would be a 3.64 constant load and that works out to a 72 hour, 72.76 amp hour battery. So this guy really here, this guy here is really a, a 72 amp hour even though they say oh it's 100, 122 sounds a hell of a lot better than 72. So um, I'm not saying they're being unscrupulous. Walmart is just getting the manufacturers, but these manufacturers and even if they ever start so-called expert is just selling you and trying to sell you this battery that isn't as good as maybe some of its competition. Um, I bought a lot of them and when you stand in the store it looks great. Um, sometimes you see reserve capacity, so I'll talk about that real quick. So reserve capacity, this is a formula online that I found, is 0.4167. You multiply it by point. 4.1 or 40%, and that gives you the 25 amp hour rate. So that's where the 25 dead to 25 hours. What's the amperage? Um, so dead. So that becomes a you know to do the inverse math, so that would be 77, and 77 divided by that is about 186 reserve capacity. So you see the reserve capacity a lot. If you ever need to do that calculation, but then you really need to back it out. You can back it out this way and back it get it back to a 20. You could do that, um, but. Um, a rule of thumb you see online is people say, I'll take the reserve capacity divided by two, and then it's actually it's a little bit less than that. But you see, uh, particularly like sailors, they, they tend to, you know, people who really need a battery uh, to run off battery for extended periods, they go out and do the reserve capacity calculation. That's how they size their battery bank for their sailboat. And then they think they got, you know, 16 hours, and then they get 10 hours into their trip or eight hours into their trip, and they got a fully flat battery. And they're like, what the hell's going on here? And then they got to start running their generator, or run their engine, and they're using their gas up. And hopefully they're not crossing the Atlantic when they do that. But man, a lot of information. Don't use reserve capacity. And if you do use it, make sure you use 40% of that. And then that's a, it is, it's better to just get an Excel spreadsheet out here and get the math so you can, because these are important info when you start drawing. When, if you, when you know your known drawing currents, 
you can figure out the time to dead. I'm going to use the 8. I'm going to come back to 8 in a little bit in my later example, but it's 6.6 .6 hours until fully dead, right, on this particular battery. Um, as a, uh, Another example down here, I took a Sam's Club battery. Now, they were a little more um, generous. They gave me a 20 amp hour rate. It rates out at 105, and they don't give you the damn conversion unit out of it. It's 105 amp hours it should be. So that's industry standard. So this, this Sam's Club was a little bit better on site. This is a group 31. This is a group 29. This is a group 30. This is a bigger battery. I know it should be a little bit better. Um, then they give you some minutes at 25 amps. Okay, well this doesn't exactly jive up with the law, but I can get a good idea. It's not too far off. And sometimes you see marine cranking and all this. Other. So sometimes you don't get this stuff. But the Sam's Club, they did a lot better job than their Walmart um, compatriot. And the biggest difference, this is an $86 battery. This is a $95 battery, provided you have a Sam's Club membership. So for seven more dollars, or whatever that number, nine more dollars, then um, this battery at 20. Here I've done the, the calculation again. Again, this one, they give me the 20s. And they, they, they made it out at 105. B2 is my amps that I'm putting in and the, the law. So that's the the, um, the formula that I'm using over here. But basically, the 20, I needed to put 5.25 in there um, to get the 105 amp hour. But then if I do 25, that's that. And, and basically, if I do 1 amp, it's a 203. So it's a lot more powerful than this 122. So good deal for $7 more. And this is where you start to get if, you, if it drives you a little bonkers because you just don't get this information on the website from a lot of stuff. But if you can get that particular info, you can back cycle it and say, now you can start to compare batteries on a comparison by comparison. So if I'm going to spend, I'd rather spend seven more dollars in the future and get a, a basically a 203 versus a 122. Big difference there. So it just, uh, as long as you can, the size and weight are a little bit bigger on this. A lot of times size and weight is a good thing. But at the end of the day, even if you can figure out that info, it really doesn't tell you a lot about the composition inside, and that's really tough to get info. So, you know, this if you're pulling big loads out of batteries, this one might actually have thinner plates than this, or this one might have thinner plates than that, and just even though it's got a, a much higher rating, it might just uh, cycles die out a lot quicker on this one than that one. So it's, it's always a lot of guessing game and just a lot of trust and just not a lot of, a lot of misinformation on battery. Don't tell people, you know, people are going to tell you they know it all, and they just don't. It'll drive you bonkers, but... Um, sometimes you just got to buy your batteries, but like I said, you start buying 10 of these and you're talking about a grand, right? So, um, want to hopefully, you get a lot more value uh, depending on, on what you're looking at. And, uh, you know, true people use like 6-volt carb, you know, if you really want to get into this, you're going to use like Trojan T105 6-volt golf cart batteries. Those are the greatest, uh, but they're very expensive too. Just whatever your budget allows, this is the cheap version to get things relatively good for you at a, at a decent price, um, FYI. So we talked a lot about batteries, talked about charging. I'm going to talk about AC inverter loss since that's the most common. Um, you know, it is real. It is something you have to calculate for when you think that you're going to run stuff. Here I got just the battery, I got my AC inverter, and I've got a freezer example. Now freezers are very um, cost consuming terms of energy they don't run very long so this is a good example but if it's light bulbs and stuff you can figure out what you're doing um, so converting to AC you get some losses and you got to run your inverter I've got my clamp meter coming out of the battery my DC clamp meter to measure my amps because that's a quick way to do stuff and I've also got the kilowatt on the appliance I can plug this into my house wall and give me the wattage that this runs um, when the compressor is running on it or when it's, when it's what it's drawing and then I can because this is cyclical in its nature the motor doesn't run all the time uh, I can measure it over a day and take the average in a day or several days you know I can I can take the average amount of, of watts it uses in a day or I can leave it in line in here so you, there's a couple ways you can do that but eventually you need to determine your loads you always need to determine your loads uh, for what you're intending to use the system for and if it's a television it's a television if it's a freezer it's a freezer um, so here's a real world example. I've got the Sunforce True Sine Wave inverter example. So when I, you know, when I have it hooked up and nothing's powered and nothing's plugged in, it doesn't take anything out of the battery, right? But when I when I fire it up, when I just turn the inverter on and I don't have anything connected, I'm not pulling any load. I just turn the inverter on. It's got a microprocessor in it. It's running some smarts. 
looking for waiting for wattage, right? It's going to pull 1.3 amps or 15 watts. Nothing plugged into it. So you're pulling 15 watts out of the battery. And so that doesn't sound like a lot, but over the course of a day, 24 hours or 20 hours, that's, you know, 300 watts or whatever that is. And all of a sudden, I remember we talked about being a 1200 watt, you know, you pulled out a quarter of your battery. Um, you know, not quite that much with the Perkins Law, but you pulled out a significant amount of your battery just running this thing without any load on it. So you're going to need to, you know, it's not going to last forever, and you're going to need to come up with a replenishment scheme, a recharge scheme. Um, so that's what this takes just turned on. Now, when I have power actually flowing through it, you'll have the overhead, the, the, the 15 watt, but you'll also be losing in the conversion uh, when you're drawing actual current out there. So when I'm, I've got this thing powered in, and this is compressing, it's running, um, and the compressor settles down a little bit of that, as it is a motor. Then I'm pulling with the amp meter, I'm pulling 8 amps, or at 12 volt, 96 watts, when it's on. So again, uh, separately, I've, I've measured this, this freezer, and when it's running, just the AC into the wall, or just on this kilowatt meter in between, it's running 60 watts, or 5 amps. You know, so 60 watts. Um, so the difference in that is sort of the loss of going through this AC inverter. And it's a pretty big, pretty big number, right? It's it's depending on how you feel about it. It's it's either 36 watts, or you can take the one amp of overhead off, and it's 24 watts. But it's 24, 36 watts. So when you're running this thing, yeah, it's actually a lot more costly than it seems. And that's where you make some mistakes. You go out here and measure it, and you say, oh, that's that's. 60 watts, that's 5 amps, so I should be able to run that for 100 amp hour. I should be able to run that for 20 hours. And no, you need to do it at the higher rate, you know, 96 watts or, or 80 amps. And even then, you don't want to do that straight calculation. You want to do the Pukers law. Of course, this isn't running all the time. It actually runs about 10 hours out of 14 in a day. Well, let me go with that example. But anyways, there is a loss in there, and that loss is real. And there is just loss when you have the converter. I know when this isn't when you're not running something, you cannot run the converter, and then your battery's going to stay in pretty good shape. But a lot of times online, people give you this number: 80 to 85 percent efficiency, or you know. So you, 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 people do that calculation. Say, oh, it should be 80 percent efficient, and so this should, you know, if this is pulling five amps, it should just be, you know, 5.5 amps or something. And it's not; it's eight amps. Um, so big difference. That's how you're going to drain your battery a lot quicker than you thought. Now, 60 watts out of a thousand watt, you know, as you start to prose a thousand watt, it gets a little more efficient. So it might be efficient in that higher wattage, but you, you, you can't really, you, you're going to need, you know, if you're pulling that much energy out of a battery bank, you're going to need a really big battery bank. You might as well run a generator or something. Um, but at a, at a minimal 60, a very small amount proportional to a thousand watt, then, then, uh, not not as efficient as it seems so that's a mistake that some people make again measure your system uh, like i just outlined there and you'll 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 figure out what you need so uh, down here in the, the fine print i'll read it because it's fine print but i've used the kilowatt to measure what this freezer does in a day because like i said it doesn't run 60 watts continuous and um, the daily usage ends up being about 600 watts as a freezer I know it takes 60 watts when it's on, so just do some, that you can do some math with, right? So you take 60 divided into 600. I simplify the numbers a little bit, but but it should, it should be running 10 hours a day on average. And so um, the other 14 hours a day, it'll be just not compressing. It'll be turned off. Um, so at 10 hours a day, you're going to run this 8 amp load. That's 960 at, or 96 watts. So it's 960 watts you're going to pull for its compressing in a day, and then you got 14 hours where you're just running this inverter um, at 15 watts. So that ends up to be 210. So 960 plus 210 sums up to 1170. So that's the watts from the battery that you need to replace. So you can start to think about that. I mean, that's that's might be a bigger, a, a much different the number than what the standard people give you advice for. Um, but, you know, you're going to need to run solar panels or uh, figure out your, your generator, how to deliver that. It's not really useful by itself, but I'm just saying that's, that's an example where I've done a calculation, I've done a measurement on an item, and I know that I would need, let's say I get the rule of thumb for solar is five hours. 
of daylight. You might not get any daylight in a storm, but you know, five hours of daylight, so you need well over 200 watts of, of panels. So to replace that in a given day. Um, um, so yeah, that's the price, and that's that's what you should be sizing it. And if you try to size it in a different way, you're just going to be um, not using that solar power or, or just charging yourself a lot more money. Or if you're trying to do a battery bank, again, um, we talked about 8 amps. I can sort of ignore that and sort of not ignore that. Remember my, my Type 29 battery. Let me just cycle back real quick. 8 amps. It was fully dead in 6.6 .6 hours. So you can divide it by 2 for half dead. Or you can just say, hey, I'm going to fully dead. Pretending you're not doing a replenishment scenario. Um, but this guy would run... Uh, six hours compressing so yeah this battery would be fully dead in six hours so let's just say you just want to kill these batteries right and, and run your freezer as long as you can now we know, know this is only cycling half time so I can get back up to doubling that to, so that, that freezer would run for 12 hours uh, half on half off pulling eight amps um, with this uh, with this battery so yeah and, and uh, what I say 12 hours 12 hours you'd be dead so you want to run for 24 hours you need a couple of those batteries and you need to kill the batteries but that's how long you can run your freezer now freezers again are very costly and expensive but maybe you want to do lighting or something and you find out hey your light will run for five days or something like that it is do the math um, but that's how it's done so here's some handy accessories um, I've talked a lot about the kilowatt kilowatts are about 20 bucks and what that does is measures AC current but not so much the current I want the watts that it's consuming you know instantaneous watts and uh, measures the total AC watts used over time, which is good for cyclical items. Of course, if you're just, you know, you plug in a 100 watt light bulb, when it's on, it's drawing 100 watts. And for the time you have it on, it's 100 watts, right? So it's, uh, you don't need a kilowatt for that. But for a lot of electronics, like a, a computer that draws different power, depending on how fast the processor is running, I talked about motor examples, I talked about all kinds of stuff. Um, kilowatt is good to put on it. And, and figure out what it uses in a day or something like that and then you can size your your, your system accordingly, uh, accordingly for a backup. I talked about a DC amp meter particularly this clamp type I got lucky online these are about 40 bucks online of course prices go up from there um, but that's been a good one for me that measures DC current and it does it in a non you don't have to wire it in style you just clamp it around and so that's always a good item to have when you get in the DC world so you can see what kind of draw Voltage meters are all over the place, anywhere from $5 giveaways at Harbor Freight all the way up, but, you know, 5 to $30, um, most of them are pretty good um, when I talk about the next step. But you're going to use that to measure DC voltage um, in your system, and so it helps be accurate in that DC um, but a lot of these voltage meters are multimeters or digital multimeters. You probably want a digital version. Um, they're set up to, to be set up AC voltage, right? So they're measuring AC voltage. It comes from how they're calibrated. So I, um, down here I have a voltage standard, um, sort of an odd item you pull, but that'll put out a, it's got a little battery in it. It charges by USB and, and it'll provide a good calibrated 12 volt standard and so most of these especially the super cheap five dollar ones they have a little potential meter and you open it up and you can uh, tweak it a little bit turn that potential meter and, and get this thing to read 12 volts DC against the standard and then it's pretty accurate in that range so even a five dollar one will be alright um, for the for measuring voltage because like I said when I had that big chart you didn't want to be off by a couple tenths or a tenth and if you put a couple meters on there you'll find all the couple tenths difference um, so it's good to have that voltage standard just to buy, so you can buy cheaper meters or even if you have an expensive meter you just don't really know those could be off too because they're just not always calibrated to the voltage um, you know they're accurate once you get them dialed in but they're usually not dialed into that they're dialed in the potential meter on the inside it is dialed into AC voltage not DC it's a good idea to have a voltage standard uh, you can do transfers I guess if you had a fully charged battery and see if it measures 12.7 um, different ways to do that but that's worth 30 bucks right uh, amp these things are less than ten dollars a piece and they're just amp meters I usually wire them in lines particularly on the solar side they're really good to have 
Uh, but anything, it'll, it just gives a visual indicator of the real time. So you see that, you know, that if your charger is charging at, you know, solar panels are putting out two amps, then, you know, you can tilt it to the sun or you can do whatever. You can see it's putting out the two amps. And it's also telling you the battery's not charged. But as the battery starts to charge up, this will drop down. So you can kind of determine where your state of charge is or how many amps are going into or out of battery. So it's, it's good to have these wired in, just good visual indicators. So you can just look at it real quick and not have to try to get an amp meter on it. Um, um, in your systems. It's a luxury, um, but something I'd, I'd recommend getting a few of those at whatever ranges that are appropriate, you know, zero to five on a 100 watt panel, but if you are got this 55 amp charger, you want a much bigger one of those. Um, wire and some of these quick disconnects, a lot of the solar uses these two pin, sort of marine grade quick disconnects. There are other styles out there too, but those are kind of helpful if you want to change your systems around or you want to just put this you know this this meter on a on a quick disconnect so you can put it in line and take it out if you if you, if you want to um, so these these you can pick up on these are you know two to two to five bucks a roll of this 500 foot of this is 20 bucks online so that's a good recommendation to get that type so you're going to need wire and uh, quick disconnects are a good deal rather than rewiring stuff all the time unless you got a set system and it's dedicated um, gives you more flexibility I guess if you put those in there and a lot of your hookups to like clamps for quick setups will we'll want that. And the last one I got down here is a watts up meter. This one's a little expensive, like 55 bucks. It does the same thing that a kilowatt does, but for DC, I tend to not use it a whole lot. It's only got like 10 gauge wire or something. So once you get up to really high amperages, it's like not a not a good thing to have in there. Uh, but it will, you know, measure 100 amps or whatever, and, and it does the same thing. It'll so th you see these a lot with RC cars for RC batteries. But if you had a DC appliance that ran intermittently, I mean, you can kind of figure that out just by running it for a little bit. Um, but the uh, this will this will accumulate it all. So it's, it's probably good for your solar, and it's good for a number of reasons. But kind of a luxury item at 55 bucks, you can sort of do the same thing with kilowatts or amp meters or just. Uh, trying stuff out a little bit but it's out there and and i i picked up one most of the time the other pick up one so this is not a, um that's the accessories that i went through i'll post a lot of these below um probably other accessories maybe you could get around to but but um those are the most common ones that you should at least have in, in your arsenal uh, i've also got a mechanical thermostat this is about a 50 dollar item and this is something i use to convert freezers to refrigerators and you can cut off you can cut off ac power at a given temperature um, some air conditioning might work that way too if you know most air conditioners have a temperature control but um, I use, use that for converting uh, freezers to refrigerators because it's uh, freezers are a very efficient refrigerator and you can see that you know air conditioning and uh, refrigeration f freezing are some of the most uh, consuming items other than like stoves right electric stoves um, those are consuming too so stuff that's you know that that this will help out with that um, converting to use a chest freezer or some kind of freezer as a, a refrigerator so good accessory to have so in conclusion same points I had at the beginning you learned that DC crap is expensive and if you get your calculations wrong and you buy a bunch of extra that you never use it's really really expensive or if you don't maintain it uh, most of this DC stuff very expensive um, options and opinions and advice are inaccurate bad you get on the websites you start seeing that Maybe you got a little more power now. You can say, hey, don't call them an idiot, but just they're not accurate. Don't use starting type batteries unless it's in a real pinch. Car batteries. Um, charging probably takes more time than anticipated unless you're just doing the bulk staging. Um, good to know. Batteries vary widely. So here's where you can make a, you know, you can start pouring $500, $1,000 or more into batteries. Then uh, a little bit of research or a little bit of law plugging in, you can make a, a small amount of difference in your money, you can make a big amount of difference in the batteries. Uh, a lot of times calculations, especially on the site or advice, give uh, way overestimate your battery life. Unfortunately, these batteries just don't last a long time when you're drawing stuff out of them. If you just put a simple DC light bulb on it, it'll last a good long time and you'll have light for weeks. But a lot of stuff that you want to try to run, um, pretty taxing. AC inverter loss is something you always have to figure in there, figure out what your AC inverter is running, and maybe you can find, I don't, I haven't done a lot of inverter 
examples, but I, there's probably a big difference between inverters, and I just, I, I don't know if you ever get that online. I never, if they posted that as a stat, just like the batteries themselves, I'd try to find the most efficient one, or one that doesn't take as much power out. And I've talked about handy accessories, and this has been some calculations along the way to help you. So hopefully this uh, got you a lot further along. It took me quite a bit of time, years even, to to get the basic info out here that I'm able to dispel some of these uh, online stuff and some of the calculations that people gave you that I took to heart that just didn't work out in the real world because they uh, were just not good, not as good estimates as doing the real data. All right, thank you. If you get a chance, please leave your comments below or questions, and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, I don't want to get into detailed battery chemistries and all the other stuff. There are other probably watch another couple uh, YouTubes yourself, um, getting knowledge is power. Um, and uh, like I said, leave some comments. And if you like this video, uh, I don't know why you would like this video, kind of boring, but uh, if you like it, give it a thumbs up or subscribe to my channel or check out some of the other videos on my channel about this uh, refrigerator and DC type stuff. All right.